I want to add my welcome to uh, the, uh, those who are visiting with us today. If you're a guest here, we're so grateful you chose to come out and look forward to the day in which you're no longer a guest, but that you want to be a part of the family of God here. We really hope that happens. And we want all of our visitors to be aware of the uh, jam program that we do every Sunday morning during the sermon period. And I want to invite those children to come to the front now. Sloan, you have a song prepared for this moment. And uh, we'll have a song, and they'll be uh, then ushered to their classroom. They'll enjoy a, a marvelous class designed for them uh, while we're able to enjoy a message here in the auditorium this morning. Go ahead and make your way to the front. As we, see, as we send the kids off, let us sing uh, song number 337. Hallelujah, what a savior. A man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood, hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was He. Full atonement can it be, hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die, it is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes our glorious King, all his ransom torn to bring. Then a new this song will sing. Hallelujah, what a Savior. What will be the song of invitation, Sloan? I can announce it. Number 71 will be the song of invitation in just, in just a few moments. I want to talk to you today about divided homes. About homes that have, well, first of all, political differences can sometimes be uh, rather awesome division in the home and can create stresses and issues. Uh, James Carville, some years ago, a leader among the Democratic Party, helped get Clinton elected, uh, is married to uh, Mary Madeline. Mary Madeline uh, is also a political uh, person and helped to get George Bush elected. I'm going to tell you that their household was a rather difficult one when both of them were leaders among opposing political parties. But I'm telling you that religious differences can create a far greater divide and a much more difficult place for harmony in the home. Last week I spoke at length about choosing a mate that will also support you in your Christian faith. That Among the list of questions, and I really challenged this to my, my daughter, Taylor, is where I first came up with these thoughts. Uh, and talking about making certain that you first of all marry a, a mate uh, that is a child of God. And so uh, t today I want to deal with the other side of that coin. Because in many cases, the horse is already out of the barn. If someone is married to someone with a different religious background or perhaps no religious background, for that Christian, the home has uh, got some divided issues in it. 
And harmony can very well sometimes become difficult. Now, I have no angst against the idea that a husband and wife not be both of them faithful Christians in the sense that really in background, I was not raised up in Christianity. There was a period in time in which my wife Brenda was a faithful child of God and I was not. Now, it comes to be that she made all effort to convert me to Christianity before we got married and she was successful. As I'm sure each woman or man who is a spouse that's not a Christian would do everything they can uh, to win their spouse to Christianity for the soul of their sake and also the happiness of their home. But what about once it's already happened? Countless Christians who are married to unbelievers face a whole dilemma that when both are believers, they just the problem is not there. And the Bible describes several Christian homes that are so beautiful and so powerful and so happy and successful. Uh, and, and it is in a united Christian home that that's found. Acts 16, 14. Lydia of Thyatira was a seller of purple goods and was a worshiper of God. And the Bible says the Lord opened her heart to listen to what Paul spoke. And she was baptized, and notice this, and her whole household with her. Acts 16, 30. The jailer at Philippi was taught the gospel, was baptized that same hour of the night. And it says he was baptized along with all of his family. And then he brought them up into the house and set food before them, referring to what he did for uh, Paul and Silas. In Acts 18, in verse 8, Crispus, who was the ruler of the synagogue, uh, believed in the Lord Jesus and was baptized, it says, together with his entire family. And along with that, many of the Corinthians were also believers and were baptized into Christ. Romans chapter 16, in describing the beauty of the Christian home, Paul ends the letter of Romans 16, 3 by saying we should greet uh, Priscilla and Aquila and the church that meets in their home. But even in a great home, even in a good Christian home, the beautiful homes we just saw described, there are going to be issues, moments when happiness is hard to be found. And as hard as it could be tried, if the home was divided religiously, it becomes all all the more difficult. And so my point of my lesson is this. The Christians should, if they are married to non-Christians, then what are they to do about it? Well, it becomes a focus on the family's happiness and unity. Harmony. The marquee out there says harmony in a divided home. Even though the home is divided, it can be happy. It can have harmony. But there are certain principles that must be found, that must be done in order for that to occur. I cannot imagine how James Carville and Mary Madeline, the two I mentioned earlier that were political adversaries, how on earth did they eat breakfast together? How did they literally sleep at night in the same room without there being debate continually? I don't know how they did it. I just know they appeared to be happily married folk. And the same thing can be had in the home that's divided, where one is a Christian and one is not. There are issues that are guaranteed to be built into that that are difficult and divided. But I believe harmony can be there, and I'm going to make some suggestions today as to how that might occur. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul writes concerning them that they might very well convert their spouse. He says, how do you know, O lady, how you might possibly even convert your spouse to Jesus? Well, I'm going to suggest you do it. That's the best case scenario. That is the end of my sermon. The wish I would have, if you're sitting here this morning and you're the spouse of a Christian, but you yourself are not a Christian, if you're not a believer, or if your household is divided, spiritually speaking, maybe you have religious beliefs, but they're not that of your spouse. If your spouse is a member of this congregation, I want you to know I'm about to give them a challenge that they are to become the best wife there ever was. They are to become the best husband there ever was. And if they listen to me, you hear me, ladies and gentlemen, if you become that best spouse there ever was, that'll be the best plan for both harmony in your home and for winning your spouse to Christianity. And so those of you that are not Christians or or are of a different religious faith, I want you to appreciate this this morning because I'm going to be all over your spouse about it's all their responsibility to make certain that you've got the happiest home of any couple there ever was. And if she or he will listen to what I have to say, the tragic result of divided homes 
can be relieved. There are difficult challenges. Members with non-members in divided religious homes. And so having said that, consider with me, if you will, five basic principles. That if you're a Christian and your spouse is not, or your spouse is of another religion, then we do not first of all consider these five principles. Number one, you cannot drive someone to accept Christ. A part of the division that occurs in the home is over the angst, over the difficulty, the anxiousness of the fact that you don't believe the same things, that they're not a part of the same Christian values that you are. Well, you cannot drive someone to accept Christianity. The gospel by its very nature has its own powerful force and allow it to do what needs to be done. For you see, the gospel's power is not that of driving someone to something, but rather drawing them. It is a drawing force, not a driving one. Romans 1 and verse 16 says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And therein, my friend, is the key. The gospel is what needs to be in your heart, in your life, ruling the things you say and how you act. It is the gospel. You know what the gospel is? The gospel is the story of salvation, but it is also the story of having Jesus as your Lord. And the first thing you need to do is to make certain that Jesus is your Lord, if you ever expect to have your spouse to choose that as well. In John 6 and verse 44, Jesus said, No man can come unto me except the Father that sent me draws him. You see, the nature of Christianity isn't that we are dragging people to the water and throwing them under. It does no good. And you can't, you can't drive people to it either. Rather, what you do is, is you draw them. You draw them to it. And you allow God to draw them to it. It's actually possible for Christians to exert so much power, so much effort in trying to change the heart and mind of their spouse that they just drive them further away. Non-Christians might very well revolt, revolt and bring out the stubborn nature that exists in all of us, except for me. <laughs> That's right, Lou. Go ahead and laugh. <laughs> yeah, we all have a stubborn streak, all except for me. And, and, and because of the fact that we're being shoved into something, most people react in a stubborn and hard-headed way. You want a companion that truly does obey the gospel. If you're attempting to drive somebody to do it, well, first of all, do you really want them going to obey the gospel just because you say so or because you want them to? No, what you want to have happen is, is for them to be drawn to the gospel. The key is to increase their want to, their desire, for them to see the church, the family of God here, as an incredible group of people that they desperately want to be a part of. Because if they see that, then they will want that. Which reminds me, there was an announcement I was handed that I handed to... Uh, Dennis. It was a card from Brooke and Laura, uh, or Lori uh, Allen, and it was a thank you card. And talking about this church being an incredible, unbelievably beautiful family of God, that's, I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't have the card in front of me right now. Basically, the Allens said that we're the most gracious and loving and kind congregation the church has ever seen anywhere on the planet, and their preacher is pretty good too. And so having said that, uh, but what I want you to know is, is that if in fact you can convince your spouse that what I just said is true, then they may very well want it. But you'll not be able to drive them into the church like cattle into the back of a trailer. In John chapter 12 and verse 32, Jesus, Jesus it says this to His disciples, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people unto Myself. And he said this to show by what means he was going to die. And he was referring to his crucifixion. But I want you to hear what he said. The logic is impeccable. Jesus said, if I be lifted up on that cross, men will come. They will come. And that, my friend, is what you do. You hold up Jesus in front of your unbelieving spouse or your spouse who's of a different religion. You hold up Jesus before them, the Jesus that this church serves and loves and seeks to be just like. You hold Him up, and He will draw them. And so you lift up Jesus by conversations around the, the dinner table, or in the evening as you're both sitting together, or whatever the moment may be. Brag about God and His blessings. Brag about the church, its people, and the family uh, nature of the church. 
and what profits there is in that. And brag about the promises of God and how they've been fulfilled so many times in your life. I'm telling you, if you're wanting to convince them that you've got something worth having, you need to talk about it. You need to brag about it. And that'll work not only on your spouse, but it'll also work on the unbelievers that are around you in the community, your friends, your neighbors, co-workers, whatever. Brag about the fact that the God you serve answers prayer. You heard Dennis a little while ago in the announcements. He was absolutely correct. We've been praying fervently for Lawson Hitch and, and for Brooke Allen and for a host of others who are now doing better and sitting among us. Our God answers prayers. You make sure your spouse knows that on a daily, regular basis. In the process, you'll draw them to want to be a part of that as well. Number two. And the second basic principle is that don't, don't press doctrinal confrontation. Don't be a Bible know-it-all. I mean, the fact of the matter is you probably are. You probably know a lot of Bible. And if your spouse has no interest in religion, they probably don't. And so maybe you'll win the argument if you start an argument on the Bible, but if you do, winning the argument doesn't draw them necessarily to Jesus. And so don't press doctrinal confrontation in such a way that you become a Bible know-it-all. You and I both know no one likes a know-it-all. Bible confrontation without respect for the other person's beliefs is just going to do more harm than it is good. You can beat them on the head, over the head all day long how that instrumental music is not acceptable to God and that the church here sings a cappella because that is what God wants. You can beat them on the head with that all day long. You may convince them you're even right. But those who lose an argument generally are not happy in the end for having done so. The non-member mate says, well, I, I, I can't go be a part of your religion because you just think you're the ones that are all right and nobody else is right. And so what I'm saying to you is don't come off as though you have to press doctrinal confrontation all the time. And by all means, don't be judgmental in this process. Yeah, you may know what the Bible says about certain doctrines that are uh, taught by others that are false doctrines. And I'm not saying that you should not correct that which you know is false. If, that, if that's what the conversation merits, just don't come off as someone who's judging others. Just try and show what the Bible says and let it go with that, and don't be condemning of others. James put it this way in James 4.11, and this will be a good application between you and your spouse. Do not speak evil against one another. There is only one lawgiver and judge, and he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? I'm telling you, it's not my case to say, well, anybody ain't going to my church and going to hell. You can't say that for several reasons. This verse would be one, but for another, how do you know so much? It is God that is the ultimate judge. I really am sad when I hear people from denominations in this community say that, oh yeah, the Church of Christ, they're the ones that think they're the only ones going to heaven. I'm telling you the name out front is not what determines who goes to heaven. It is those who obey the gospel and are thereafter faithful to it. Now there is some, there is some teeth in that, you understand. Because if those that don't obey the gospel aren't going to heaven. But that's not my choice to choose which ones are which. The question for you, my friend, is have you obeyed the gospel? First Thessalonians chapter, or 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 says, those that do not obey the gospel will suffer eternal hellish damnation forever in anguish, destroyed from the presence of the Lord. The Bible's clear on that, but it's not my job to throw them there. It is my job to simply tell them they need to obey the gospel. So if you're sitting here this morning and you've not yet been baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, if you've not yet done that, you need to do that because to not obey the gospel has eternal consequences. But for me to sit here and tell you that I'm the only one going to heaven and everyone else is going to hell is a rather judgmental statement that we and I should not make. And then also, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3, on this matter of not pressing doctrinal confrontation, there are just going to be things that you differ with people about. I, I wouldn't be surprised that there are biblical things that you may differ with me about. And that being the case, I, I, you know, I, I once heard about a fellow that he and his wife were talking about the Bible, and he says, you know what, I can't figure out anybody that sees the Bible exactly the way I do. Everybody I know is wrong about something on the Bible. 
And so I question whether any of them are going to heaven. And quite lately, honey, I'm not even too sure about you. That being said, they've drawn themselves into a circle that only they fit in. And that's no attitude for a Christian. Instead, we should think of it this way. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 that we should make every effort to keep the bond of peace. Okay, The unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And that unity is predicated on these seven things. He says, uh, be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace, for there is one body and one Spirit, as you are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. I've just given you something of which the Bible says there's only one of. Seven things of which he says there's only one of. And that's a long enough list for you to try and agree on. If you can get your spouse to agree on any seven things, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that you're just going to have to wait and, and be kind and peaceful about it. Don't press doctrinal confrontation if you want to win them. A third biblical principle is in being diligent student yourself to know what God says and does. Some are never going to be able to win their spouses because they're not equipped to do so. If you don't know what it means to obey the gospel, if you don't know how to be a faithful Christian, how on earth are you going to convince your spouse to become one? And so be a student of the Bible yourself. Be a diligent student. Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, that you should be, first of all, sanctify Christ as Lord in your life. And then he says this, in your heart. And then he says this, and be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks you, a reason for the hopes within you, with meekness and fear. He says that you and I as Christians should be ready to answer why we believe what we believe. And so certainly the child of God, the Christian in a home, if they're going to convince their spouse to also become a Christian or to turn from the religion they have that teaches false things, they're going to have to be a good Bible student themselves. Maybe the most important thing you can do is to open your Bible and to learn exactly what it means to have Jesus as Lord in your life and in your heart. Because until you've learned what it means to have Jesus as your Lord, You'll never convince your spouse to it. We need to learn the mind of Christ through His Word. Philippians 2 and verse 5 says, Have this mind which was also in Christ Jesus. I'm telling you that if you do that, if you learn to have the mind of Christ in your mind and in your heart, if you sanctify Jesus as Lord in your heart, as Peter writes, well, two things will happen. First of all, you'll become a much better Christian, a much better spouse. And you'll be far down the pathway of trying to show your spouse what a real Christian looks like. Because oftentimes, and this is not always true, but oftentimes the reason why a spouse isn't convinced to become a Christian is because what they're witnessing standing right next to them is not much of a Christian. You and I need to be students of God's Word, and Jesus needs to be Lord. Fourthly, the fourth principle is that you'll never win your mate if you yourself are not engaged in worship. Your mate will not respect your religion if your religion doesn't involve conviction. The willingness to do whatever it takes to be a faithful Christian. For example, coming to worship. Don't neglect the worship or the ministry of the church because as your spouse sees that you have very little interest in the church you're a part of, why should they want to have such interest? They may see your, uh, you uninvolved and unfaithful and in not in attendance, and wonder, wonder why they should be. However, if they see you involved, if they see you faithful in worship, then they at least know you're glad to be here. If you compromise, though, it not only will fail to win your spouse, it may ultimately lose your soul. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 does indeed say that we should exhort one another. But it goes on to say, and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. The idea here is, is that you and I need to be in worship, to be present, and to present a strong and serving and active Christian example. In describing the perfect Christian wife, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1, Wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, that would be a non-Christian. That would be somebody who's not a faithful Christian. He says to these wives who are Christians, you be subject to your own husbands. That would be that unbelieving or uh, of a different religion husband, you be in subjection to your own husband so that even if they do not obey the word, they may be won without the word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Two things out of this text rather quickly. Number one, 
the Bible does acknowledge the fact that there are some homes where one of the spouses is a Christian and the other is not. It's not wrong. It's not evil. It's not sinful to have a spouse that's not also a Christian. This text, in fact, defines what that wife should do if that's the scenario they're in. Be the best wife you could ever be. In the process, he may very well win them, he says, even without the Word. It's not winning a Bible argument. They just see your godly behavior and want to be a part of that. Verse 3 of that text goes on to say, and do not let, be, uh, do not let your adorning be external, like the braiding of hair or the putting on of gold jewelry or, or the uh, clothing uh, you wear. Rather, he should be, what it should be is let it be the adorning of the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. And herein is the point. Is that this spouse that you have that isn't a Christian or isn't a faithful Christian or is of another religion, when they see your gentle and quiet spirit, when they see the hidden person of your heart, and I assure you, lady, he knows your heart. I assure you, man, she knows your heart. And when they see that heart that is truly devoted... And they see that active Christian example. They'll want to be a part of it. Then also Philippians chapter 2 adds to that this characteristic. He says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not only look for your own interests, but also to the interests of others, and have this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And it goes on to say how he became a servant. I'm saying all that to say this. If you would act the Christian that you need to be, this will be very appealing. And for those of you that have a spouse that's a Christian and maybe you aren't a Christian or you're of another faith, I'm putting this challenge before your wife or before your husband that they need to become one who doesn't do things through selfish ambition. Can you see how if a person lives their life by not doing things out of selfish ambition? but rather in humility, count the other as more important. All of that lends itself. That's what Christian values are. And a Christian who has those values is in a position to be able to get their spouse to also want those values. Fifthly and finally, be patient in prayer. I said a little while ago that prayer is powerful. That we have folks among us who have been sick who are now doing much better and it did not look good. Uh, prior to that, as though they would get better. And yet they're doing better. And we have much to be thankful for because of that. And I'm telling you, you should be praying for your spouse. If you're a Christian and your spouse is not, you should be praying for them on a daily basis. Not, not just praying that they might see their knuckleheadedness and turn to Jesus. That's not what I mean. Praying for them that they'll have joy and they'll have happiness, that they'll have peace, that they'll be able to see within you the character that you're trying to be for Jesus. You pray for yourself that you become a better wife or you become a better husband so that in the result of that, by being the child of God you ought to be, they will see that. You pray about that. Many companions have been converted as a result of what I've been describing today. And that soul is just too important to do otherwise. I'll leave you with this thought. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and and it shall be opened unto you. I'm reminded of what James said in James chapter 1, you have not because you ask not. Jesus promised if you'll ask, you'll have it. And so be persistent in prayer for your spouse. Even though he or she may not be yet a Christian or a faithful one, you keep them in prayer. Keep yourself in prayer. The point of this whole sermon was so that the Christians among us who have spouses that are not Christians may find harmony in their home. It may be divided religiously. There may be things that cause difficulties between you because of that. But you can have harmony if you'll apply these principles. Dedicated Christians need to be concerned. Need to be concerned about the soul of their, their spouse. And so if you're sitting here this morning and you're not, uh, if you're not a Christian, you're not really the one I was speaking to today. <laughs> Up to this point, I've been talking to your spouse trying to convince them to be the best wife or the best husband that has ever been had. If I'm successful in that message, your marriage is about to get better. But let me tell you how you can make it even more better if you are that non-Christian spouse. Obey the gospel. Lay all that to rest. Because the person who has the greatest power 
to create harmony in the home is the one that needs to come to Jesus. And so I plead with you, be drawn to Him. Be drawn to the people of God as we stand and as we sing. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver only you can satisfy <clears throat> you alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye you alone are my strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. So grateful for your presence today, especially if you're a visitor among us. We are truly grateful you've come out today. Uh, Sloan and I and the kids that uh, are going to camp will be leaving as quickly as we can. I, I will not spend much time shaking hands because uh, we're already behind the, everyone else that's going. We're, we're leaving later than everybody else. Uh, all the rest of the campers are on their way. So we're going to make it as quickly as we can. I want to draw your attention to something that you may very well have received in the mail this week. The church is mailing out house-to-house -house magazines to everyone in the Grosbeck and most of the Thornton mailing district, out on the lake anyway. Uh, in any case, you may have received one of these this week. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I hope you did. Uh, we're sending out half of the mailing district on one month and the other half the next month. So uh, if you received one last month, you wouldn't have received one this month because it's, the, the mailing district's divided in half. So in any case, you have a very blessed week. And happy Father's Day, Dad. Oh, by the way, Father's Day. This is what my wife got me for Father's Day. My tie's cooler than your tie. <laughs> Our closing song. <laughs> Our closing song will be number five hundred thirty-five. Number five thirty-five, the Glory Land Way. Mm -hmm. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer for I'm in the glory land way. List to the call, the gospel call today. I'm in the glory land way. Wanderers come home, oh, hasten to obey, for I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. 
I'm in the glory land way. The heaven is nearer and the way grow with clearer for I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. The heaven is nearer and the way grow with clearer for I'm in the glory land way. Would you enjoy the prayer, please? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning just uh, thanking you that we can gather as one Christian family and visit with each one another. Father, we know that you are the greatest Father that's on this earth. And just thank you for all the blessings that you've restored upon us. And Father, as we journey to our homes and be with our families, just guide, guard, and protect, and look over them. And be with all those that are unfortunate, all the children. And just be with those that are in a foreign country. Father, just look over them and protect them. And as we journey to our homes, just look over and guide us so we can be in attendance with our families of next week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.